Mm. Boy, you look like you hit that. was dying and the idea for driving down to Florida to see him one final time was Dominic's. DiMaggio called Johnny Pesky, his teammate for all those years, to see if he would join him. Johnny loved the idea and signed on immediately, even agreeing not to smoke his requisite two cigars a day. Bobby Dore the fourth player of those old Red Sox teams who had remained so close to each other, would not be able to make it. He lived in Oregon, and his ability to travel was severely limited because his wife of 63 years, Monica, had suffered two strokes and had made only a partial recovery. They had, the four of them, Ted Williams, Dominic DiMaggio, Bobby Dore, and Johnny Pesky all played together on the Red Sox teams of the 40s. That meant they had been friends for more than 60 years. My guys, Ted liked to call the other three. And he, in much the same way, was their guy. It was, Johnny Pesky once said of him, like there was a star on top of his head, pulling everyone toward him like a beacon letting everyone around him know that he was different and he was special in some marvelous way. And that we were much more special because we had played with him. a certain era, right after or at the time of World War I. They are all from the West Coast, played in the Pacific Coast League. It's a poor America, and none of the four goes to college because unless your parents in that era went to college, you weren't going to college. They had to maximize their talents. Nothing was to be wasted. Remember, that's the era of trains, which is very different from airplanes. On the train, it was like a club. I mean, they talked, they'd be eight hours from one city to another, and they'd be playing cards or talking, and there was much more of a community. We'd go to the dining cars before anyone else, and we'd have all the waiters in white gloves and tablecloths, and everything was top grade. The games that we played, the fan tan, the poker, the bridge, hearts, all those games, the closeness. It was just a great feeling. They could even remember the exact moment when they had first met each other. In the case of Bobby Dore and Dom DiMaggio, it was just after Bobby had signed on with the Hollywood stars. When I joined uh, Hollywood in 1934, Vince DiMaggio was an outfielder on our club. When we'd go to San Francisco, play a series up there, Vince would invite us to come out to his parents and have dinner. And that's the first time I saw Dom. Papa DiMaggio made his own wine in the cellar, as people did in those days. And these old line ball players would come in and they would drink the wine hard and fast. And Mr. DiMaggio would just hold his glass and sip it slowly and watch them. And pretty soon, they would all go under the table instead of him. Bobby came to our home. I would look at him and say, my Lord, he's, he he's, looks like a baby, and he's playing professional baseball. And then when I asked how old he was, and somebody told me he was younger than I, I couldn't believe it. And Dominic remembered that Bobby was always nice, and he wasn't stuck up. 
It hadn't gone to his head that he was a pro ball player. Nothing ever went to Bobby's head. He hasn't changed a bit. What you see today, he has always been. In the case of Johnny Pesky, the other three had seen him first as a small, somewhat scrawny clubhouse boy who worked in the locker room for the local Portland Beavers of the old Pacific Coast League and whose job it was to wash the sweatshirts and jocks and shine the shoes of the visiting players. But it was in Pesky's rookie season with the Red Sox that he first remembers Ted Williams acknowledging him. I went to spring training and at night we always ate at the hotel. I'm eating with Bobby one night and everybody perked up and here comes the great Williams and he sat down with us and never took his eyes off of Bobby and I'm sitting there and I'm, I must have gone about 20 minutes and finally looks over and he says, you're a pretty good hitter. And I said, yep. He says, well, if you hit 280, you can help us. I said, 280, hell, I can run that much. But I used to get a lot of chink hits, you know, based by the mound and off my end of my bat. They had stayed together and remained friends in no small part because Ted had willed it to be. He was the most compelling personality among them. You have to be very, very good to live as independently as he did, outside the laws of convention, to live to your own rules. He was the real John Wayne. I mean, John Wayne was always cinematic. John Wayne was perfect age to serve in World War II, but did not choose to do it. Ted served in two wars. The best illustration of Williams's authenticity and independence came on the last day of the 1941 season. He could have played it safe, taken the day off, and rounded off his .3996 average to 400. And the thing about Williams is it's a sort of a pristine thing. Hey, 399 point whatever. We don't round things off. And so he goes up and he gets six hits and he hits the 406. It's a wonderful reflection of the time and place, and I think it's why he's considered to be so special. He did it his way. Of Dor, DiMaggio, and Pesky, each of the three was married to the same woman he had been when they played. Ted had been married three times, never with demonstrable success. And though people often spoke of him as the greatest hitter of his age, no one ever spoke of him as the greatest husband or father. We were having dinner, and Ted said to me, he said, Dommy, he said, I, I admire you for what you've done. I said, what are you talking about? What do you, what do you mean? So he said, well, you got through to playing ball. You went into business. You did this, that, and the other. And I said, what about you? He said, well, he said, I wasn't as fortunate. He said, I, didn't, I wasn't successful. He said, I haven't really done much in my lifetime. He thought he was a failure, and I lit into him and told him what he had done, how he had done it. You've served your country not once, but twice. You were a person that people looked up to. You have done more in your lifetime than 99 and 9 tenths of the chief executive officers of this country. And he looked at me, didn't say a word. I said, and don't you ever, ever let me hear you say that again. They were more than teammates. They were each other's friends. Their mortality linked to each other through a thousand box scores and long hours on trains together. Through certain rare moments of pleasure and even more shared moments of disappointment. Now, as they began the journey, both DiMaggio and Pesky knew this was the last trip and the last time they would be together because Ted Williams was dying. breath that lasts and lasts. Dentine Ice. Nothing's colder than ice. One big time dirt and odor gone. New Neutrogena Men Power Scrub Bar has it wrapped up. The washcloth and deodorant bar in one. Special texture scrubs deep down. Devours odor. Want to feel a new kind of clean? Neutrogena Men Power Scrub Deodorant Bar has it wrapped up. Yeah, no. Your chai latte, Mr. Perry? 
Kim, dude, I was really feeling that one. I was him. Yeah. He wasn't him, I was him. Right. X Games comes to L.A. It's off the hills for Shizzle Dizzle. Starts August 16th on ABC. X Games 9, presented by Mountain Dew. I'll race my dog. I'll race any dog. I'll race your dog. Pick the animal. I'll race it and beat it. I'll race you, your cousin, your auntie, your mom, your dad, your nephew, your, your nieces, whoever. You name somebody. And I'll race them. I'll race an all-American, all-state, world-class athlete. Point them out to me. I'll race Lance Armstrong on his bike. 100 meters. 200 meters. Anybody. Anywhere. Anytime. Put him next to me. You say go. I'll race him. And I'll beat him. It's a story. Get an unprecedented look at the making of the best sports show on television. This is Inside Sports Center. And it all leads up to the live broadcast at 11. This is Sports Center, presented by Microsoft, Tuesday at 10 on ESPN. Sure, I respect the traditions of golf, but I gotta admit, I'm really looking forward to the Battle of the Bridges. Tiger Woods and Ernie Els face Sergio Garcia and Phil Mickelson. Lincoln Financial Battle of the Bridges, Monday night, 8 Eastern on ABC Sports. Championship Television. Although he grew up in Los Angeles, Bobby Dorr had borrowed a little money from his father and bought 160 acres on the banks of the Rogue River in Ilhe, Oregon. And emotionally, over more than 60 years, never really left there. Even in the years, he happily went off to Boston to play baseball. As they grew up together on the Red Sox, and Williams struggled, especially with the media, Dorr was his confidant. On road trips, Williams would want to go out for a walk, but only with Dorr. And if Ted's swing slipped out of sync, only Bobby could tell him about it. If anyone else tried to talk to Ted about his swing, he would explode. The friendship had its roots in the Pacific Coast League, where Bobby and Ted played on the 1936 San Diego Padres. He took a liking to my mother and father, when we go to uh, Los Angeles, why, uh, he went up to our folks place and had dinner and he said, Bobby says, you're the luckiest guy to have parents like that. Bobby came from the most balanced family imaginable. Mr. Dorr loved the idea of Bobby playing professional baseball, encouraged it, encouraged them to have fun, went to every game. Ted loved that, saw it, admired it, and in the sweetest way, envied it. He could look over and see how balanced Bobby always was. Bobby has that equanimity, nothing throws him. Versus Ted's own imbalance, then he obviously was smart enough to track a lot of that back to the different ways they were raised. They had not, of course, gone to Ted's house in San Diego when they were both young and playing for the Padres as if the subject as well as the home was off limits. It wasn't until 25 years later in 1961, when Bobby was having lunch one day with Ted in San Diego, that the scars of Ted's childhood were revealed. After lunch, Ted said, I want to take you over here and show you where my uh, dad's photography shop was. And when we got up there, why well, this old room was empty. Then we turn around and walk back down the stairs, and right on the corner, he says, right here is where my mother used to make me march behind the Salvation Army band. And he says, I used to try to get behind the big bass drum and, and kind of hide. And it just seemed like he, 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 you could see a six, seven-year-old kid talking, and here's Ted Williams as a, a grown man. And I thought, boy, oh boy, this is where that all happened. 
and it was like unlocking the past. It was the rare moment where he would reveal himself, which meant that almost only with Bobby, whom he loved so much, would he, would he, would he do this. He really had a horrendous childhood. Father was an alcoholic who really couldn't function. His mother was this sort of angel of Tijuana Salvation Army who would go do these marvelous things for the indigent of Tijuana, but nothing for her own family. He had to go home a lot of nights and scramble eggs and get his own supper. No home life at all. It, it's just when you look back at it, it was it had to be awful hard life for him. Baseball was a world Ted loved and understood. His teammates became almost unconsciously his family. The universe of baseball, where he understood all the rules and all the demands, was comfortable for him. A truly just universe, where only talent mattered. First and third occupied, two men gone in the ninth. Five, four in favor of the National Leaguers. Williams hits a towering fly. It looks as though it's way up in there. Way up, way up, and the top hits the top deck, the third deck, and this ball game is over. Everybody grabbing Ted, patting him on the back, and the kid really laced that one out. The wiring was very, very acute. You, you could be talking to him, and some you'd hit a tripwire, and off he would shoot like that in anger. And is that DNA? I mean, is there an anger gene there? Is it just the thinnest of skin because the childhood was so painful and is it one is it the other or is i suspect a combination of two the thing that has irritated me more over the years than anything else has been the fact that untruths written about me in the paper and uh it just irks me and irritates me so much that uh i just explode at times and uh, possibly do things that i later wish i hadn't have done in ted's boston years his parents now divorced he would send money back to his mother but there was always his brother Danny to consider. He had never amounted to much, always in and out of jail. And a reminder to Ted of what he might have become if it had not been for baseball. His mother was always hounding Ted for a little extra money, and, and Ted knew that this money was always going to go to the brother for something. He was sending money back already, and a lot of it. And then he got a letter asking for more, and he knew that it was his mother fronting for his brother Danny. And Bobby said how he would crumble the letter up and just throw it away. Bobby Dorr understood better than anyone the patience required of Ted's friends. And yet never suspected that patience may be tested one day fishing in the Florida Keys. Ted's going to get breakfast. For he says, I'll boil the eggs. And he says, you get the grapefruit. Heck, all I ever did was take a knife and peel around the grapefruit and cut I just cut through the segments. I didn't cut each segment, you know. So when he goes to sit down, he uh, says, Jesus Christ, how did you cut these uh, um, grapefruit? There, in the home of one of the last great perfectionists in America, he had carved the grapefruit wrong. After breakfast, they went down to the dock, and Bobby had tracked some dirt onto the boat and Ted had shouted at him, damn it, why can't you wash your shoes down? It was not a good start. There's about four or five big tarpon right out from the boat. I made a perfect catch, and this 80-pound tarpon hit the lure, and I could feel the thing broke off. Ted said, what the blankety blank happened now? Well, now he's got to tie another lure on. All the time he's tying the lure on, he's just cussing a blue streak about my fishing. Then in another cast, Bobby couldn't tell what was the head or the tail of the fish, and he casts the tail, the fish spooks, and it, goes, it gets worse and worse, and Ted is getting angrier and yelling. My back's getting tired, and I, I step back down in the boat to get kind of relaxed. He said, what are you doing? I said, my back's bottom. I said, get back up on the box there. And so Jesus, like a puppy dog, I get back up on the box. Now I'm saying, Jesus, I hope we don't say any more tarpon. I, 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 don't, I don't want to foul up anymore. So, my gosh, here a little bit of great big tarpon kind of rolls in front of us. So I cast, I made a perfect cast, and Jesus, the thing grabbed it, and he must have jumped. 
eight, ten feet out of the water. The line breaks. Here's Ted putting his beloved friend on the fish. They are finding fish. The fish are big, and they are getting a fish on almost every cast, and yet they don't catch it. And so Ted feels the failure. Bobby, who's so balanced, knows exactly what it is and why. And it's really in some odd way about love. And so he takes it in stride, and he understands that there are just layers of Ted that are more complicated that he had never explored before. Up until that day, Bobby had thought there were two Ted Williamses, a joyous, generous one, and a second, darker one. Now, for the first time, Bobby Doerr decided there might be a third Ted Williams, someone even darker and more volatile than he ever imagined. When they went back to the house at the end of the day, Ted said, I guess I was a little hard on you out there today. That, Bobby thought, was as close to an apology as you were ever going to get from Theodore Samuel Williams. Said a hip hop, hippie to the... No sense hitting the snooze. No fresh and piping hot anytime you want them, even breakfast. Yo, yo, word. Guess what? It's the OK Decide Already computer sale. Because all you've got to decide is whether you want $300 off our Gateway 300S desktop or $200 off our 400SP Plus notebook. What does the plus mean? Why, it means this notebook features a CD burner, DVD combo drive, and a mobile Intel Celeron processor at 2.2 gigahertz. That means it's fast. So call, click, and come in today for great gateway computers featuring Intel processors. On the trip to Florida, Johnny Pesky woke up in the back seat and asked Dominic, where are we? When informed that they were in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Pesky replied, My God, I used to manage here. Amish country, very nice people. Then he went back to sleep. And that seemed quite in keeping with the trip that wherever they went, John Pesky had been there one time or another, always in the baseball uniform. So many towns and cities formed a map of America, John Pesky's own private United States of Baseball. Day at 7.15 a.m., you can find Johnny Pesky having breakfast in the Salem Diner with his pals. He is still a major local celebrity that does not seem to know that he is a celebrity. When one guy don't show up, we worry about him. John is rich, if not in traditional terms of wealth and accumulation of material things. Thank you so much. Oh. In friendship, and even more, in palship. Go home, you Yankee. They say the good old days, that's a crock. There's no such thing as a good old day. Today's a good day. I think there's a great sweetness to John, a capacity to calibrate his life as he lived it with what might have happened if there had not been baseball. You can look back and see how rich the journey is. And you've had wonderful friends, people care and remember. The Paveskovichs are Croatian. Johnny's dad settled the family in Portland, Oregon, where he worked in a sawmill. There was never much money in the house, but the $15 per week paycheck ensured that there was always food on the table. When John Paveskovich was about 12, he got his first job keeping the bullpens clean for the Portland Beavers of the old Pacific Coast League. From there, he graduated to Clubhouse Boy, where he could earn as much as $10 a week in tips. Eventually, he played minor league ball, working the sawmills during the day and playing ball at night. The name is Paveskovich, but you know, he couldn't fit all that into a box score of the day, so it gets shortened to Pesky. 
Needle Nose, he had been called, even when he was in the minors because of his prominent nose. But no one liked using that nickname more than Ted, somehow with its use making Pesky the younger brother he had always wanted, instead of Danny Williams, the younger brother he actually had. Pesky and DiMaggio were still in Pennsylvania farm country when conversation drifted to the players they hadn't liked. Spud Chandler of the Yankees, Pesky said, was tough. God, he was mean. He'd hit you in the ass just for the sheer pleasure of it. Pesky had washed his uniform when he was a clubhouse boy. I don't think he liked me too well, and he didn't like me as a clubhouse boy, and I think he disliked me five, six years later when I'm hitting off him. In my rookie year, I'm playing a ball game in Boston, and he's pitching. The sports writer comes out right before the game and says, you know, Johnny, you're 0 for 14 this season against Bud Chandler. And Ted hears this, and here he comes. He says, yeah, for crying out loud. He says, this guy has told you that hard sinker. He said, you're trying to pull this guy, and he says, all you're hitting is ground balls at second base. So in the bottom of the eighth inning, the score is one to one. He says, for God's sake, Johnny, he says, don't try to pull this guy. He says, well, you're, you're dumb. You're actually dumb. And I'm looking up at him, I said, yeah, I know I'm dumb. So I said a quick prayer, got in the batter's box. Ball, one strike, one ball, two. Here comes that hard sinker. And he slaps it into left field. And Chandler is furious. He's yelling, you little shit, you. The next time you come up, I'm going to whack you. So I told him where to go. And I said, besides, you were a lousy tipper when you were in the Coast League. He gets so angry at Pesky that he forgets that the next hitter is Theodore S. Williams. There's a high drive going deep, a home run. And he comes around the bases, and Williams is just in a delight. He's gloating. He comes into the dug and says, where's our needle-nosed little shortstop? Didn't I tell you? I think about him a lot, especially when I go to the ballpark and I look up and see those tired numbers. Tears could come to your face. We just want to see how many times we can hit that pesky pole down the Yeah, that's right. That's right. How many times you hit that pole? Well, I said I thought I had eight around there, but uh, they looked it up and I had six. You had six? Yeah, so I lied. Oh, okay. That's all right. You can do whatever you want to do. It's your world. We just passed no, through no, it. No, 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 you know no. I mean? Sixty years later, Pesky still works for the same company, the Boston Red Sox, which had first employed him in 1942. <laughs> It is hard to think of him in street clothes, only in uniform, and a Boston one at that. When Dominic DiMaggio was becoming successful in this business where they made synthetic rugs for cars, and he knew the Red Sox weren't paying John anything, and he offered him a job. John says, Dominic, I couldn't love my brothers more than I love you. It's a wonderful opportunity. I know I'd make more money, but I'm a baseball guy. And it's all I've ever been. It's all I'm ever going to be. They're going to have to cut the uniform off me when I go. It was to John Michael Pesky, the 82-year-old man sleeping in the back seat, the sense of the perpetual youth who had remained, though he had long since grown into manhood, still a boy. Saturday, the day of reckoning, Judgment Day, D. Saturday is 60 minutes that last for generations. I bleed red, you bleed orange. It's upsets, blowouts, trick plays, and trombone players they still can't tackle. Around here every day is Saturday. NCAA football 2004. Rated E for everyone. If it's in the game! EA Sports. If it's in the game! When did you first try it? Two weeks ago. Last night. Why do you like it? What's not to like? I'm calling my grandson across the country for three cents a minute and 39 cents to connect. 10-10-987 is cheap. It's cheap. Dial 10-10-987 for three cents a minute to Canada and Western Europe, too. Three cents a minute to my cousin in Ireland. To my boys in Canada. That rocks. Could it be any easier? I just dial 10-10-987, then one and the number. What's to think about? 10-10-987. You gotta try this. 
Lobo, slow down. Let's see what's going on here. Yeah. The new yellow pages are out. Let's see which one they pick. Yellow book or the other book? He's taking a yellow book. Ah, yellow book. You see what she's choosing? I told you they all pick yellow book. Oh, no. Yellow book. Hey, look, she's taking one of ours. Yeah. Oh, yellow book. Again, I think again. I told you we're in trouble. Hey, we work for the phone company. What are you doing? I can see why people love it. Today, people are choosing yellow book, not that other book. Call 1-800-YB-YELLOW. It's about time you and I had a little talk. Well, what's up, Dad? It's about these magazines you've been hiding. Now, tell me the truth. Where did they come from? Mom's got them for me. Your mother? She knows how much I love Sports Illustrated. Sports Illustrated? It's not even costing us anything to try. Try Sports Illustrated for nothing? If you call right now, you can try 12 weeks of Sports Illustrated absolutely free, with no obligation. You can see for yourself why over 20 million sports fans turn to Sports Illustrated every week. Call now, and you'll get 12 weeks of insider news and phenomenal photos you won't find anywhere else. 12 issues of the world's best sports magazine to try for yourself absolutely free. So I can call and try Sports Illustrated free, just like you. Excellent idea, Dad. You know, I'm really glad we had this talk. Yeah, me too. Now, about those other magazines under your mattress. Don't miss your chance to get in on Sports Illustrated's incredible free trial offer. 12 weeks of SI to try absolutely free. Call now. There had been, even as they headed through Virginia, an ongoing navigational dispute over the proper way to drive. Dominic DiMaggio, being of a scientific bent, felt that if you could glide from lane to lane as you reached curves, you could end up lessening the distance considerably and thus shortening the drive somewhat. It was another sign that Dominic studied everything and decided there was a right way and a wrong way to do things. I think I'm just impressed by Dominic as a man. How careful he is, how intelligent, how he's gone through life in an utterly admirable way. I'm someone who doesn't like fake toughness. Maybe it's because of my experience in Vietnam, but I'm not very admiring of that, a fake strength, a bullying strength. I think Dominic is a man of great, great inner strength. The day when the Red Sox are going to trade him as a tail end of the career, Dominic doesn't let people do that. He walks away on his own, and he becomes, in my opinion, the most successful baseball player of an era in non-baseball related things. He goes into industry and becomes a multimillionaire. It was true that nothing ever came easily for Dominic DiMaggio, that the gods did not seem to favor him when he was younger. He had spent much of his early life overcoming prejudices. First his size, but perhaps more important for that era, he wore glasses, which was virtually unheard of at the time. In his first year with the San Francisco Seals, Dominic remembers seeing a tall, gangly left-hander swing a bat for the first time. He was with San Diego at the time, and when he swung at a ball, he twisted himself up like a corkscrew. He was batting and batting practice, and our skipper, Lefty O'Doul, jumped out of our dugout. He says, I've got to go up and talk to this kid. Now, back in our day, there was no such thing as talking to your opponent. And then as Ted walks away from the batter's cage, grabs him and talks for about 30 seconds, and then comes back to his own dugout. And we had mixed old-timers and young fellas, and the old-timers said, Skip, what was that all about? What are you doing on the opposition side? What did you have to say to the kid? He said, fellas, he said, all I said was, don't let anybody ever change your batting style. They had always been friends, bolstered by Ted Williams' enormous admiration for Dominic as a player and even more as a man. And there had been a moment when they were all young and it was after a game and Ted was ever on his soapbox and everyone else in the locker room was not just listening but agreeing. And Dominic has this little smile on his face. He looks over at Dom and he says, you think I'm full of shit, don't you, Tommy? And Dom, he says, what makes you think that? He says, the little smile on your face. <laughs> During the remarkable 1941 season when Dominic's brother Joe was in the midst of his 56-game hitting streak, Ted, playing left field, would talk to the Fenway scoreboard keeper who always had a radio going. Ted had told the scorekeeper, when Joe gets his hit, yell out to me and let me know. He would get this information and he would yell over to me, hey, Dommy, Joe got his hit. I'd give him a big nod. They're linked 
in two billion arguments between young fans as to who was better. There's a kind of almost sports page linkage there with Dominic sort of in the middle, slightly in the shadow of each, and by far the most successful complete human being of the three. Ted was Ted and Joe was Joe, and they both dined out on the fact that they were great players, and that was it. Uh, they both had very difficult times uh, having healthy relationships with women throughout, uh, throughout their lives. As time went on, they both understood that Dom had built himself a better, more complete life than they did. Ted greatly admired him for it, and Joe, as the years went by, resented him for it. In 1998, when Joe was dying, Ted began to call Dominic four and five times a week, wanting to know how Joe was doing. I mean, they were never close. There was the rivalry between the teams and the rivalry between the men. But if an era that includes Joe is now being threatened because Joe is dying, then that has great suggestions and meaning in terms of Ted's mortality as well. And he starts calling Dominic every day. And he would say, yeah, Dominic, Dominic, how's Joe? How's Joe? What's happening, you know? And there was an awareness of a shared era, shared headlines, and now shared mortality. I think everybody thinks about it. You wonder how you're going to go. Is it going to be pleasant? Is it going to be sad? It's coming. There's no getting away from it. Rough night's sleep, no big deal? Look again. This x-ray shows no support for your neck and spine when you toss and turn on an ordinary pillow. Introducing the Contour Cloud for incredible support and comfort. See the same person on the Contour Cloud? Neck and spine are straight and supported. That's because of its four exclusive therapeutic features. First, patented soft touch memory layer molds to fit your head, neck, even your ear for unparalleled softness and comfort. Second, yellow wedge provides additional cervical neck support. Third, blue base supports and aligns your spine for a great night's sleep. And finally, this exclusive crescent helps relieve uncomfortable pressure on shoulders. It gently cradles your head and neck. It even cradles your back. I need neck support, and I used to use that, the, uh, the egg carton type pillow. I think you know what I mean. And there is just no comparison. This pillow is the most comfortable pillow I've ever used, ever. With other pillows, I wake up, I have numbness in my fingers. I have uh, 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 pain in my shoulder, I'm sleeping on my side, whereas with this pillow here, I wake up and feel as though I've gotten a good night's sleep. Watch again how ordinary pillows simply don't support you. Now see how the Contour Cloud cradles your head in softness as it supports and aligns your spine. Thousands have paid $100 for this plain memory foam pillow, but the Contour Cloud is just $19.95. No other pillow combines these extraordinary levels of comfort and support. But wait, call now and we'll double your comfort for just one dollar. That's right, when you order one pillow at the regular price, you get a second Contour Cloud for just one dollar. Now you'll have a matching set or use one as a gift. Over one million have already been sold at the regular price. Don't miss out. Call right now. Have your credit card ready and call 1-800-381-9922. Get your second cloud pillow for just $1 plus shipping and handling. Call 1-800-381-9922. Don't wait. Call 1-800-381-9922. Get an unprecedented look at the making of the best sports show on television. Live, uncut, and on the fly. This is Inside Sports Show. Go behind the scenes for the writing, the meetings. We're two outs away from television. Over 25 cameras give you an all-access pass. Do we have coffee for the two minutes? Join Stuart Scott and Kenny Mayne as they take you from the makeup room to the control room and right through the live show at 11. This is Sports Center, presented by Microsoft, Tuesday at 10 on ESPN. I can still see Dominic with a towel over his shoulder, sipping on a cup of coffee. Bobby, getting ready to get dressed, go out to take in film. There's Ted in the corner, and I'm sitting there. And we talked about everything, especially baseball. You know. Of course, Williams, he was the king. 
we were all in our early 20s. And, you know, we got pretty close. You know, we worried about one another, talked to one another, and playing with them was great. Oh, boy, at this time, it was, it was so much fun. God. There were so many stories told on the trip, but always hanging in the air was that Ted was dying. As they entered their 60s and 70s and 80s, and they understood the sweetness and pleasure of the rarest of things, their own mortality blended now into the fabric of the friendships that they began when they were all so much younger and optimistic, hoping they might be part of a team that would replace the Yankees as the dynasty in baseball. their greater experience in World Series play, in no way did the St. Louis Cardinals dominate the Red Sox in 1946. It was, in fact, as even as a seven-game series can get. And it all came down to a sequence of events in the eighth inning of the final game. Johnny Pesky was the alleged GOAT. He was the guy that the sports writers of that time fixed on as having, you know, slipped on the key play. Top of the eighth inning, Dominic DiMaggio doubles home two runs to tie the score at three. As I turned first base and dug for a little extra speed, I pulled a hamstring. And I barely got to second, never mind trying to get to third. And so they pulled me and they put Leon Culbertson in. And Culbertson doesn't have Dominic's arm. He doesn't have Dominic's confidence. After St. Louis's Eno Slaughter singled in the bottom of the eighth inning, Harry Walker came to the plate, and Dominic DiMaggio had a sinking feeling. We moved Leon from center field where he was over toward Teddy, but not enough, and I was on the top step trying to get him over even further. Slaughter is just running from day one. The crowd is pesky, can't hear anything. Johnny went out on the grass back of shortstop to, to take the relay from uh, Culberson. It really wasn't a real fern throw. Kind of a lob to make sure he hit me. Now I turned, and they said I held on the ball. And as soon as Slaughter got into the clubhouse, he told the media that he had remembered as he was getting to third base that I was no longer in center field and made his mad dash to home plate. It proved to be the winning run, and the media blamed Pesky for his perceived hesitation before he threw. It got in the paper, well, Pesky's a dummy, and they put a pair of horns on me. The truth is that Pesky made a normal play, and Enos Slaughter, who was a ferocious player, made a great play. Pesky never complained. He'd been taught early on when he was a young guy in Portland by some older players, don't try and defend yourself and put the blame elsewhere. It won't work. You're just going to have to. If you're a man, you have to take the blame. The game was over, and we're in the old St. Louis clubhouse, and I actually saw Ted weep. But there was a lot to be optimistic about. The future seemed to be set, and it seemed to be theirs. Then, in 1947, both Boo Ferris and Tex Hewson, 20-game winners in the previous year, came up with arm problems, and neither was ever the same. And with that, went the dream. Ted used to say that if we could have just won one World Series, you know, it would have been made your life pretty much complete in baseball. That's the way it is in life. There are a lot of things we like to achieve that we're unable to achieve. But you take the next best thing and go on. More than 50 years later, the teammates still wondered what had happened to Ferris and Hewson, as if the Red Sox had been dogged by dark fortune. What had gone wrong? Why had it gone wrong? things have to go just right. It's the same with brake repair. That's why you can count on Midas, America's trusted leader in brakes. Right now, get $20 instant savings on any brake service from Midas, even on Midas's famous lifetime brake pads and shoes, the last set of pads or shoes you'll ever buy. That's $20 instant savings right now from the auto service experts, Midas.
ABC Family Channel introduces Brendan Leonard. You want to make shadow puppets? Yeah, I got a bird. The Eiffel Tower. Castle. Abe Lincoln. Take that. Okay. Ooh, look at me. I'm Brendan. I'm so cool. I like shadow puppets. Dork. The Brendan Leonard Show. Weekdays at 5.30, 4.30 Central on ABC Family Channel. You want to do sock puppets? Hi, I'm John Shearer, CEO and founder of Video Professor. Something like dial-up? Imagine if everything just suddenly quit. Right. That's it. I quit. Unlike dial-up, Comcast high-speed internet doesn't just quit, because it's always on. Best of all, it's now available at a dial-up price. Voila. Bon appetit. Um, waiter? Bobby Doe was the first to go. He remembered coming in to make a play on a slow ground ball and he felt something go in his back. He had loved playing baseball, but he was 33 now and he had been doing it professionally since he was 16. Ted was gone, off in Korea, and time was running out for the rest of them. After playing in only 25 games for Boston in 1952, Johnny Pesky was traded to Detroit. Dominic retired in 1953 when the Red Sox tried to bench him in favor of a young outfielder named Tom Umflett, who lasted only one year with the team. It was a bad time in general for the Red Sox organization and its players and fans. Boston was going after young white players, and though they had the first shot at Willie Mays, they had not signed him. So it was that when Ted Williams returned from Korea, he came back to a significantly less talented team. All of his old friends gone, and Willie Mays not playing beside him in center field. What a touching side, everyone standing at Fenway Park, as Williams hit probably for the last time. There's a drive to deep right center. This may be Colin Craig way back there watching. Well, if you had written it that way, nobody would believe it, so why even try? The radio never went on. Dom and Johnny talked about everything from family to baseball. And Ted, of course. They remembered the time that Bobby had invited Ted to Oregon for some steelhead fishing. And Bobby had tried one more time to get the best of Ted Williams in a debate on hitting technique. Look. You call it. You call We're not it. arguing about nothing. You call it. Right now you're arguing about you who's going to start first. Contentious, opinionated. And he always won the arguments because he was smart. He argued well. He was louder than anyone else. And because he was the great Ted Williams, and therefore he was a appointed judge and jury. Bob gets 10 minutes to explain his theory on hitting. Ted gets 10 minutes and no more to explain his. And no interruption. He'd always back you in a corner on anything you had. He was so dominating that you, you didn't have a chance, really, to ever win an argument. Oh, that's a foul. Low blow. Oh. See? Christ, I'm in a rush. Anything right. that, what no. He's walking around the background. <laughs> Why do you start casting? <laughs> All right, that, that's Get a distraction to my concentration. That damn Bobby door, Ted would say, I can't teach him a thing about hitting. And if he wants to go through life being a damn 280 hitter, then he has my permission to do it. My God, the things he used to say about the Almighty. I, oh, my God. It's a wonder strike, a bolt of lightning didn't come out of the heavens and strike him. Your first concern should not be, I want to get on top. That's no swing. 
Look, I swing. Look, I'm hitting. Look, look. <laughs> watch the damn hip action I got here. Look. No fing hip. Boy, when I swing up, boy, I got hip action, haven't I? You can't get quickness and you can't get power <laughs> unless you've got hips in the damn head. Joe DiMaggio hit safely in 56 games. That's a great record. It may never be broken. But he never won 33,271 arguments in a row the way Tim did. Now, I love Bobby Doyle. He didn't listen. Swing up on the ball or swing down on the ball. Bobby, in his mind, is still trying to win the argument. It'll never happen. I want what she wants. I want what he wants. For my home. For my small business. Unlimited local calls. Unlimited long distance and high speed internet access. Together. Together. For one low monthly price. On one bill. So that's what I got. With MCI business complete. With the neighborhood built by MCI. No surprises. That's what I want. Get unlimited local long distance and high speed internet for one low monthly price. Call 1-800-JOIN-MCI today. If your car's got a dirty air filter, it's robbing your horsepower and killing your gas mileage. Get to AutoZone and replace your air filter today. Get in the zone. AutoZone. Excuse me. Dentine ice. Intensely cold. For icy fresh breath that lasts and lasts. Dentine ice. Nothing's colder than ice. Have you ever met special friends on vacation? I have, in Guadalajara. We stay in touch. In fact, I've been invited back to visit their home, birthplace of mariachis and tequila, and to enjoy at Vallarta its beautiful beaches, ocean marinas, and golf. The first time I came to Mexico, I was a tourist. Now, I have a city full of friends that make me feel right at home. Mexico, closer than ever. Make me look. See that? Mm hmm. That's 51 years old. Uh -huh. 51 years old, and it can run a 508 mile. Mm hmm. Can I do a 502? Sure, I respect the traditions of golf, but I gotta admit, I'm really looking forward to the Battle of the Bridges. Tiger Woods and Ernie Els face Sergio Garcia and Phil Mickelson. Lincoln Financial Battle of the Bridges, Monday night, 8 Eastern on ABC Sports. Championship Television. last months and years, it was Dominic who saw Ted most often and in whom he confided. It had gotten more and more painful, the depression that came with declining capacities ever more serious. Ted asking Dominic if he ever cried, and then Ted saying that he cried every night. Teddy, I said, we've all been dealt a hand to play, and the whole world admires the way you played your hand. You recall the past, what you've done, what you've gone through. I said, this is all part of the same hand, and you're going to have to live through it. And it would settle him down. After a night in Roanoke, Virginia, they had driven roughly 600 more miles to Hernando in central Florida, where Ted lived now. So it had all come down to this one final visit. These older men who had once been so young. They had made it through the Depression and World War II but they had never overtaken the Yankees the way they had hoped. Your perspective changes, and you see that it's more about a long journey rather than winning or losing. Maybe they should have won more pennants in World Series, but it didn't happen. And with each additional year, winning or losing a pennant means less. It's more about doing it, who you did it with, did you stay friends? Did your marriage last? How do you get on with your kids? That's the real journey. They had known over the years when one of them was sick, and they had paid close attention. 
When Dominic was struck back in 1962 by Paget's disease, Ted had said, Dommy's got this damn awful disease. Anyone else with this disease loses their dignity. Not Dommy. When John Pesky had come down with a rare allergy and began to lose weight at a frightening rate, they had all been very nervous. Ted had been sure Pesky had cancer. I'm worried about our needle-nosed little shortstop. Phone calls were made from Florida to various Boston hospitals. They had been aware as well of the problems of Monica Dorr's health and of Bobby's abiding love and care for the pretty red-haired girl he had fallen in love with when he first saw her walking in a field in Illahee, Oregon. Half the time, I never can open these things up. Here we go. She had contracted multiple sclerosis in the 40s and more recently had several strokes. Does that look all right to you? They were determined not to let the shadow of her illness weaken their marriage. All right. All right. After all these years, in some miraculous way, he and Monica had gotten it right. As they entered Hernando, Dominic was best prepared for what they were about to see because he had flown out to San Diego to visit Ted in the past year when he had started his rehab. And he knew how painful it could be on first glance to see an old friend so damaged by failing health. The immense force of the man, both physical and emotional, suddenly dimmed by a body that was breaking down. When I saw him, I thought I would die. We still had the features, but he was so drawn. Teddy raised his head. He says, Teddy, Teddy. Dominic kept on talking. He says, Johnny's here. And he kind of moved. He said, Oh, Johnny. He had a problem putting food to his mouth, but he wouldn't let anybody touch his food. He'd get into a raid and don't, and he'd push and say, Don't do that. Wanted no help. We had three great days with him. We sat around, we talked baseball. He said to us, he says, who's the most underrated hitter you've ever known? Well, this is Williams. And we're guessing this guy, that guy. No, oh, you guys don't know anything. You know, he was the same old Ted Williams. So finally, Dominic says, well, who do you think it was? He says, Eddie Robinson with the White Sox and the Senators in Cleveland. And we all looked at one another. He said, by God, he's right. Dominic suddenly said, Teddy, I'm going to sing you a song. It was the story of two men who were best friends, and suddenly he filled this house with the sound of his beautiful baritone voice. Ted loved it. He started clapping. So Dominic sang it again, and Ted clapped again. Then it was time to go. The last thing that Dominic had done was check with Ted to see if he was getting the ball scores, and apparently he was not. But I said, okay, Teddy, I will call you every day and give you a blow-by-blow -blow description. And I might have missed a couple of days, but not many. And now, late in their lives, the immortality of being a young baseball player gone. They look back and they think their lives were very good, that they got the most that they could. They're comfortable with who they were, what they did, that they didn't waste anything. And that the real rewards were not in the paycheck but in the friendship, in the doing, and in the resonance of a nice, sweet, gentle kind of fame that lasted a long time. The last thing that Ted said to me was the day before he died, and he was handed the phone, he said, hello, Dami. And that was, those were the last two words I ever heard from Ted. And I started talking to him, and I said, Ted, Ted, you there? A nursing attendant picked up the phone and said, he's fallen asleep. Well, please tell him I called, Dominic said. And the next day, Ted died. <laughs>